Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you can see, we have very distinguished panelists, so I will try my best to talk very minimally and give them as much time as they need to tell us everything that we want to hear about their subject. Um, the topic of our panel is rebuilding contemporary cities in northern Nigeria. Um, so I, I think for, to set a bit of context of what that means, um, a contemporary city would, I guess, be a city that is in step with the realities and the demands of its time. And to, to talk about rebuilding contemporary cities in northern Nigeria implies that at some point, there were cities in northern Nigeria that were actually in step with their times. Um, and, and particularly that Kaduna was such a city. Um, for those who know a bit of history, Kaduna had served as the capital of the Northern Protectorate or whatever it is that the British called it, even before Nigeria became Nigeria. So it had always been in at least ahead of its times compared to other cities in Nigeria. And I guess so that means that it was a contemporary city. The argument would then be that at some point it stopped being that. And now the panelists here are going to talk about what does it really take to rebuild a contemporary city, or rather to build a contemporary city, and particularly in northern Nigeria. So are, are we all good with this discussion? OK, great. So um, I think we'll start with uh, our mayor. Sorry, what, what title should we call Administrator. Our administrator. Commissioner. Mayors are elected. Nobody elected. <laughs> Um, all in favor of electing him mayor, please show with a round of applause. Round of applause, round of applause. You are hereby mayor of Kaba Fest. So, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, tell us about the vision, the idea, the mindset of building a contemporary Kaduna um, from when you guys came into office and what it is that KCTA is trying to do now to make that a reality. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, like you rightly mentioned in your introduction, Kaduna has been a planned city for a long time, unlike many other cities across uh, Nigeria. Um, when the British came, of course, due to its centrality, its location, they saw that Kaduna could be the center of uh, northern Nigeria, that um, they could situate the, the politics, you know, behind um, uh, northern Nigeria in Kaduna, and they set out to do that. If you notice, you go to Zaria, there's an emirate, you go to most of these cities, they have emirs. But in Kaduna, they never had an emir. Uh, they never, there was never an emir in Kaduna. Uh, because it became the capital. They saw it as a capital of uh, the northern region. They did not want it to have so much traditional influence. But there was a district head uh, who was at that time the district head of Kaduna and the Magajangari of Zazo, who was appointed district head sometime in the 40s and who laid the foundation of the Kaduna that we see today. So, of course, Kaduna had a lot of influence uh, of the British colonialists, but it was majorly driven by somebody who was indigenous, somebody who was from Zaria, and uh, people say he was the first uh, educated, Western educated uh, member of the Emirates Zazao Council. That's the Magajangari. He planned a lot of what you see today as Kaduna, like Doka. Uh, Doka is just south of uh, this location. It is where the market is. If you look at the grid-like design of the streets, you will know that it just did not come about compared to somewhere like Ungwarimi or Malali that today is seen as uh, the better part of Kaduna. Places like Ungwan Sanusi were planned. Uh, Tudungwada was also planned very well. Uh, it wasn't up, up until 1967 under the leadership of General Hassan Usman Kazana, who was then the governor of the northern region, that another master plan was rolled out. This time around, primarily to capture the industrial sites. Because Kaduna was first becoming an industrial city uh, in the
the words of some people who are becoming the Manchester of Nigeria. And he took advantage of that and invited some bit, a British firm called Max Lock to come and build on that plan. So Kaduna has always been planned in comparison to other cities, not just in northern Nigeria, but across the country. Uh, you also remarked that um, over time, Kaduna had uh, gone through some ups and downs, uh, ethnic and religious strife, which mainly began to rear its head in the early 80s and uh, reached its highest point uh, around 2003 during the Sharia crisis. And uh, of course, a lot of people who used to be in Kaduna, who had made Kaduna cosmopolitan, began to leave Kaduna in search of better places and better locations to um, uh, do their businesses and basically live. But what happened, what that brought about was that we were losing our best in almost everything. We lost our best brains, our best businessmen, our best educationists, and so on and so forth. Losing businesses meant we lost jobs that were created before. We lost um, the best teachers. Most of us here that went to school in Kaduna had Indian teachers, British teachers, and teachers from all over the world, not just all over Nigeria. Um, and in that context, even in the local context, if you look at it, Kaduna had always attracted everyone. Now I mentioned the foreigners, but let's talk about even people that are Nigerians. Most of Shaba today, just after the uh, market, was dominated by Nupis about 40 years ago. Everybody there spoke Nupi. And in fact, the first road that was officially uh, named by Magajan Gariza Zo then is Nupi Road. That was the first time we had the alphanumeric house numbering and street naming system in Kaduna, a long time ago, before anybody picked up on that. Uh, so what have we done since this administration came in is to look at those parts that were missing. How were we going to get back all those things that had gone because of the uh, strife, the religious and ethnic uh, issues that we had, that had uh, bedeviled the state and the city? Um, first of all, you need to get investors. People like Mira today are here, and if you see the kind of stuff that she has, she has a lot of local stuff, but People that interact with her at the highest level are not necessarily Nigerian or indigenous. And they visit. Oh, I mean, Kaduna, somebody just seen that Mira today, somebody who does not look Nigerian, but is Nigerian in every way, <laughs> is in Kaduna, and is, uh, she has a farm in Kaduna. No one has kidnapped her and things like that. Those sort of things began to, um, people started asking, what is happening? How come Mira is in Kaduna? How come? Uh, Olam is in Kaduna. When we first told people that Olam was coming to Kaduna, they didn't believe us. They said, who would go to Kaduna and set up the largest hatchery and feed mill in sub-Saharan Africa where all these things are happening? But because they saw people need to have hope in something. They saw what this administration represented. They saw what they wanted to do. And people began to have belief in what was happening in Kaduna. They saw the governor as somebody who uh, would do whatever he said he would do, who would just not talk about things but would actually follow up and do them. And those things, uh, he started putting all those structures in place and people saw the opportunities because the opportunities have always been there. And they saw that he had created an atmosphere, an enabling environment for these things to thrive. In addition to uh, the fact that Kaduna was, as a city was becoming more peaceful. Most of the issues we were having in terms of security were outside of the city, um, most of the crises that we have had in the city of Kaduna, we haven't had any of them, I think, in the last eight years, maybe even in the last 10 years. And people have uh, started noticing these things and said, we are going there because there's also somebody who has a vision that we want to now partner with and come uh, collaborate with to bring Kaduna back to what it used to be. Thank you very much, Hafiz. So my next question goes to Haji Amira. Um, the mayor mentioned a, 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 an important question that's on everybody's mind, if you look around. What are you doing here? Uh, is, this, is this 
fun? Okay, yeah. I, I ask myself that a lot. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm not obviously from Nigeria, but I've been living here for 12 years now. Um, came to Nigeria to work for a nonprofit. Um, really saw a lot of ways that I thought would be more impactful to sort of bring change and, you know, uh, make things better for people through for-profit means. So I, um, I quit my job. I went back to business school in the U.S. and then in 2014, I moved to Nigeria a second time to start Tomato Joss, which has actually never been in Joss. And Her Excellency reminded me that you know she's still waiting for me to change the name to Tomato Kaduna. <laughs> We're working on a sub-brand. You know, Tomato Joss has like the branding, right? It's got the ring, you know, the flavor song and everything. So, you know, I, I guess the, you know, I wanted to create something. I wanted to build something that would make a difference, that would enrich people, that would give people agency and give people power and let them make their own decisions about what they think is best for them. Um, and the way that, you know, I chose to do that is through building Tomato Joss. So what is Tomato Joss? Tomato Joss is a... Um, farming and food processing business located in Igabi LGA, which is um, just sort of, it's the largest LGA in Kaduna. I think it's one of the largest LGAs in the country, but um, where we are in Igabi is sort of near Marabanjos on the way up to Zaria. Um, and the way our company works is that we have farmland that we've um, cleared and, you know, installed irrigation on some parts of and we invite farmers onto that farmland every season um, to farm for us. And they sign a contract and we provide them with all of the loans, all the inputs, all the education and support that they need to be successful. And at the end of the season, they pay us back in kind. So through either maize or through tomatoes, depending on what season we're in. Um, with the maize, we, you know, the, or the grains, we just sell those to the likes of Olam or FMN or you know, other feed mills. Uh, with the tomatoes, we use those tomatoes in our factory to produce um, the, I, what I would argue is the, the best and the only uh, local sachet tomato in Nigeria. <laughs> so why, why, why are we in Kaduna? I mean, we're in Kaduna because basically I, I wanted to work in an environment where um, I would just get the basics, right? You know, I'm not you know, we're not, we're not looking for contracts, we're not looking for any of that stuff, right? We literally just want a place where we can run our business, work with farmers, and make a product. And, you know, the, the Kaduna State government really committed that to us. They said, look, we want, we want your, you know, your eventual tax revenues, right, when you guys become profitable. And we want, you know, you to create jobs, and we'll give you the environment that you need to be successful, and then we'll just let you run and let you be successful. Um, and, and that's really been awesome for us. And you know, we've definitely attracted folks from other parts of the country. Uh, my newest employee is here. She just moved from Lagos and she was kind of like, Kaduna, really? But I told her to come to this book festival today so she can see that there is more to Kaduna than you know, just what you read in the news. <laughs> And um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this panel. I'm excited to talk about you know, what I think makes for you know, a, a great city and how we can all help Kaduna to get there. Thank you very much. And Sanusi, I, I think everyone knows, or most people here know that you are, you are the, tech, the original tech bro of Kaduna. <laughs> um, why Kaduna? Why, why would a, a tech bro as advanced as you are at almost what would seem like the peak of your career look around and say, oh, okay, let me head to Kaduna? Um, that's a good question. So, I mean, I, I think all, all the reasons they said are valid. Um, um, when, I was, when I was thinking about setting up, I was thinking about, you know, um, a place that would sort of that had like a lot of space for growth, but also had like um, access to market and the infrastructure that was necessary. And, and Kaduna sort of just ticked all those boxes. Um, Kaduna has, I mean, coming from, I mean, I, I lived in Lagos for a while and 
you know, um, if you've lived there, you know, I'm not going to explain what it means to live there. Um, but being able to wake up and dash across the city for a meeting in 10, five, in 10 15 minutes, you know, huge um, thing. And then there were other things. So Kaduna is, is, is close to two underserved markets um, for everything, not just tech, right? So Abuja, you know, is close. Kano is close. Lagos is a flight away. Um, that made sense to me. The basic infrastructure was there. There's a lot of talent. Kaduna actually has a history of, of producing some of the most outstanding talent just over time. And, and this is not just in, yeah. And this is not just in technology, like in, in um, you know, in, in things like entertainment and, and stuff like that. It's, it's always had that sort of talent. Something about the air, I don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> Um, helps people really excel. So, you know, I, those sort of were like the things I was looking at, and I saw this tremendous opportunity um, to basically replicate myself, which is the original idea. Um, when we started Colab, and the people who know like really early, it was just an experiment. It was, and the ex experiment was simple. Like, is it possible to build world-class talent and world-class companies from Kaduna? Like and and you know that was that was the the you know the what the thesis you know six years ago and we're happy to say yes it's very possible. How so? How so? I mean I think we 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 want to know what what are some what has success looked like for you? Um, okay, what does success look like for us? I mean, um, in the time we've been here, we've incubated a couple of companies. Um, one of them is called Sudo. They do um, car dishing infrastructure. Um, they're probably the most popular one because they were on the news for raising close to four million dollars in investment um, recently. Um, there's Schoolmo, also based in Kaduna, that serves over 120,000 um, students in Nigeria. Um, there is um, th there, there are a bunch of them. There's Payan. Payan processes over a billion naira every every month. Um, these are all companies that you know were born and brought up in Kaduna. But besides the companies. You know, if we talk about talent, I mean, today we actually literally have hundreds of people um, that have gone through Colab who work in um, global technology companies today. We have people living in Kaduna today who work at Microsoft. We have people at Paxful. Um, we have people at um, all over, all over the place. And when, when we're talking about jobs, we're not talking about like, you know, entry level. We're talking about like the people at Microsoft work in the mixed reality team as software engineers, not you know, as, um, not as clerks or staffs or, you know, something like that. So really high technical jobs. And they're based here in Kaduna. Yeah, a lot of them still live here, actually. And, and that brings me to my next question. So it makes sense that if the government has put in place things to attract your business um, and to attract Mira's business, that you would take advantage of those. But it doesn't, what exactly then is it about the city that makes you feel compelled to make it your home? Not necessarily a place where, I mean, how do you go from Colab, which is a hub for people who are in tech, to being one of the proprietors of the upcoming tech city? H how do you go from being Tomato Joss to being, I, I mean, I learned from you about the polo races and how that used to be a part of Kaduna. So that's certainly not in your farm. So how do you get that invested where you're sharing the history and talking about this being your home? Sanusi. I thought we were going to do ladies first. Uh, <laughs> I mean, so I, I, I think the thing is this. I think, I think Kaduna is a really nice city. Uh, uh, the best person to actually answer this question, unfortunately, is on the panel, but she's sitting in the crowd is my wife, because she moved from Lagos to Kaduna. Um, and, you know, when, when we got married, you know, we, also have to, we used to dash to Lagos a lot, and then one time um, she went to Lagos to do like some quick running around before traveling, and she spent all day in traffic between the airport and Lekki, and then was drenched in rain and all of that. And when she came back, she was like, <laughs> you know, so, so the, the city is nice, but the other thing is that, you know, when, when you're doing like your life's work in a place, um, it sucks you in, right? So you start to see, um, you don't just walk um, across like a street or walk across a problem, you walk across it and you see what could be better. And then you try to sort of, you think about what you can do to make it better. 
and I think, and, and just you know, to, to chip this in, that I, I think that two things um, are responsible, or two things um, would make a, any city contemporary. I think one is just the infrastructure, you know, which we see a lot, and then two is it's communities and building communities around that infrastructure. Once you're able to nail those two things, everything else sort of sorts itself. So we focus on building community. We're a community first before anything, and then um, we provide infrastructure, build community on top of it. And, and I mean, uh, let Mira answer, but when I think about tomato just now, it's, it's sort of like the same thing, infrastructure and the community around it. Yeah, thanks. I think, um, I guess I'll, I'll answer the question a little bit differently first and then sort of loop it back in. But when I think about sort of like cities that stand out in the world, right, it's like I usually have something that I can immediately associate with that city. So if I think about LA, I'm like, oh, Hollywood and the film industry. You know, if I think about um, Milan, I'm like, oh, fashion and, you know, it, whatever, you know, high, high, fancy Italian cars. You know, if I think about London, I think about, okay, Big Ben and the finance capital of the world, you know. And so I think one thing that, you know, we all can help, you know, is to create, what is that association that you have with Kaduna, right? Like when you think Kaduna, is it, you know, I think it used to be polo, or it used to be textiles, or it used to be, you know, Peugeot, right? But the question is, you know, what do we want it to be today, right? And there are some cities that don't necessarily have an immediate association, but still have a great urban feel. So like Vienna, for example, right? You might not necessarily think, oh, like, I know exactly what it is, but it always makes the top city in the world <laughs> list, right? And and. A big part of that is the infrastructure, right? The roads are good, the streets are cute, there's not a lot of pollution, you know, people can, there's like things for people to do, there's ways for people to interact with the city. And so I think that like things like this, um, and you know, I apologize to the organizers for always, I was actually in the market this morning and I was like talking to distributors and trying to, and like going around and trying to like take sachets out of cartons and like display them this morning. So it's not all glamour. When I say I'm busy, I'm like actually like out there doing, <laughs> you know, doing the needful um, and trying to just make my company work. But uh, you know, it's like, those are the kinds of things, right? That we can create, right? You know, okay, can you create these cute little, okay, Barnawa is known for this. And you know, oh, if you go up here, there's this neighborhood that's like this, right? Like I think the ability sort of to create those communities and promote those communities and you know, give the people that are in there a chance to sort of like organically create a vibe, that's what's attractive to people, right? And so I think that's a big part of it too. Um, for, from Tomato Joss, you know, like our company and factory and farm are not in Kaduna town. So, you know, we've definitely done a lot in terms of creating community around Kangimi Village, um, you know, rehabilitating schools and things like that. But I think from what I think about more is, you know, my employees, right? And what are the neighborhoods that they want to live in and why, right? And how do we create more neighborhoods that people want to live in, that people feel, you know, excited about, oh, there's things to do here and, you know, um, I don't know, just create that, that, that community, like, like Tanusi was saying. That's sort of my take on it. Thank you. Um, so I'll come to you, Hafiz. In, in all of this development, in all of these big ideas, what do you say to the argument that there is an elitist twist to it, in the sense that while we're attracting the best minds from around the world, what happens to those people who are here, who don't necessarily understand what's going on, who, uh, I mean, there's generations between when this contemporary city we're talking about happened, and now that there's a process of recreating that, and they seem to not, on, all they see are, uh, I guess we'll call them the side effects of this process. How do you sell this idea to those people? Um, you are right. And uh, for us policymakers, it's something we always have to think of every day uh, and explain every day, but we can't get everybody to agree with us. But this is also the disadvantage of leapfrogging. You've heard of leapfrogging? where you move from like uh, 
two to almost ten because you missed all those steps when you were supposed to take them. Because people, of course, they are very discerning. If you are growing at a small pace or at a slow pace, they are able to catch up with you. But when you are faced with the option, the only option being that you have to leapfrog, and then you do that, there are many people that won't follow you. And then you will, are now forced to explain to them. Uh, but it's not in everything that we do that we actually leave out a number of these people that you mentioned. If you go to Tomato Joss, sorry to come back to you, but the people that she works with, the people that extract value out of her business, being in Kaduna, they are not in this hall. They are local farmers who earn 50,000 Naira a month. But they are beneficiaries of our program. Without that tomato just in that community, they probably wouldn't be able to earn that amount of money. There are also people, for example, who supply raw materials to Olam. Just last week, because of the upcoming card invest, we've had to start asking them, where are these farmers that you buy? And we do this every year. And I had calls to speak to one of the farmers who I was just trying to ensure that that farmer was a beneficiary. And he just went on and on about his story. And I was actually very impressed and thrilled that this is somebody who farms in Giwa, who ordinarily, whenever they farm, they have to look for where to sell these products. So there's an added cost. Transportation out of the uh, farms, looking for who to buy. The longer it stays on the shelves without it being purchased, the lower the price. But now they know that the moment they farm, Olam is waiting for them. So it depends on who you are listening to, really. And of course, when people say, oh, the infrastructure is only in the city, the first four years of this administration, most of the infrastructure was done outside the three cities. And even as we speak right now, what you see, because even the Kaduna city, there's, well, for most people, they see this Kaduna North, Kaduna South, that is Kaduna. For us policymakers, we see Kaduna North, Kaduna South, Chukun and Igabi as Kaduna. So when we build roads that bring together two communities in Igabi, for example, we see it as Kaduna City. But a lot of people in this room also do not see it uh, as Kaduna City because Kaduna City to them is anywhere from here to Stadium and uh, to Kau. So it is finding a balance. Everyone, both parties are right, both parties are wrong. <laughs> it's about finding a balance and for us to keep doing more to educate them. It is our job to let people know what we're doing. It is our job to explain our decisions. And I think we need to do more, perhaps, just so that we'll bridge that gap. But I can assure you that even though it feels that way, it is not necessarily so. OK, I'll, I'll come back to that. And I'm sure there are people in the audience that would want to address that question directly. Sanusi, I'll ask you the same question, but in a different twist. When, when, when talking about a tech city and tech hub, you're bringing an idea that is not necessarily a mass appeal idea. I mean, how do you have an entire city that has tech as part of its concept? How do you educate a population about a notion that is supposed to become part of their identity? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So, I mean, the, the thing about this is that, in my case, I've been there before. Um, six, seven years ago, when I was telling people about Colab, they were like, uh, like, you know, it doesn't make sense to me, right? And the way we've always approached this, um, like I said, is via community. So we build a community around something. So for instance, you know, to use the city in particular as an example, um, the very first tenants that we think would be in the city are people that are at Colab today. There are people that, you know, have, I mean, came, some of them came as, I mean, some of them didn't even go to school, some of them came as coppers, but today live in Kaduna and, you know, earn a few thousand dollars every month. You know, they are, they are the people who are thinking about primarily, because part of the idea of the city is how do we keep these people here? I mean, they're earning London money now, so, you know, very soon they would want to, they would want to move to London, but how can we recreate and disincentivize them from moving? How do we create the infrastructure? How do we create the community that makes that decision a little harder, 
right? That's sort of the way we approach it. So it's, it's, it's from a community perspective. It's not, I mean, when, we, when, when um, people talk about collab, maybe because of Andela, people think about developers, you know, wearing jeans and sneakers and, and shorts. But there are a lot of people from Barnawa Market, right, traders whose children, right, earn thousands of dollars today. Not from Yahoo. Not from Yahoo. <laughs> don't worry. If you didn't get it, don't worry. <laughs> from, yes. from, from writing code, from doing product design, from doing data science. It's, it's literally, Colab is open. Like the doors are open, literally, right? And um, we, we work on that level. So it's, we create movement first, then you move the movement to the infrastructure. The infrastructure itself, you know, isn't very useful if, if there's no activity, if there are no people. People are the most important component. So we focus on people. We focus on, like, we think about, like, what their aspirations are. We try to get them to see the bigger picture. We try to get them to buy in. We make it such that they are, um, it's, in fact, they, they, they're the ones now that are pestering me, like, how far, when is the next, when is, you know, move, when are we doing stuff? Because they've bought into it, maybe even a bit more than I have. And it's, it's, it's a weird thing because it now creates sort of like a reinforcement circle in the sense that when I think about the fact that maybe this thing is a bit crazy, I see all these people who are like, you know, what are we doing next? And, and when, you know, they start to lose hope, they see this guy who is also, you know, doing this. So I, I think that's sort of like the way it works. So Hafiz, I'll come back to you on the question of identity. Um, what, Bira mentioned that big cities or any city has something that it's known for. Do you, do you have an idea or is there an idea of what that identity would look like for Kaduna City? Um, like she said, again, which you didn't capture, that some cities also don't have a particular identity. And I think um, we've had the Pojo era, we've had the um, textiles era, those identities come and go. But I think what I would want Kaduna to be known for is that it is a city of opportunities. And for me, opportunity is anything that makes you thrive. It depends on you, what are you looking for? But that you can be in Kaduna and pursue whatever it is that you want to pursue and be successful at it and ensure people are actually looking at you and you inspire your community, the people there. So for me, I would want to see Kaduna uh, be intact as a city of uh, opportunity, beyond those little, little cliche stuff that we like to uh, talk about. If Big Ben is in London, I mean, they like Big Ben. Who likes Big Ben? Who likes to see a big clock TikTok? <laughs> I'm not sure it adds anything, but it's, that's, it's British culture. But for me, I just want People say I'm in Kaduna where I can be whatever I set out to be. The opportunity is there. Opportunity is the word. So, so this would be the era of opportunity then? Precisely. This is why Kolab is here, I think. is that opportunity that they seized. This is why Tomato This is why Kaba Fest is here. And so many other beautiful, great things happening, both in terms of ideas, in terms of people. Kaduna is really the, the new land of opportunity in Nigeria. Final word, Mira, before I open it up to the audience. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I do love Kaduna, right? And I, I love, the things that stand out to Kaduna for me, you know, is the, all these, the, the trees and the greenery and the river and, you know, the, the fact that there is opportunity, but also the fact that there's a lot of history, right? There is a lot of history. It is, it was the sort of premier city in northern Nigeria, and I think there's a lot to tap into to sort of give that pride. And, you know, it's about, to me, it's about, you know, identifying those communities of people that are doing something interesting and, and elevating them and creating more pull into those communities, like what, you know, Sanusi is doing with Colab. And it's about attracting cultural events like Kaaba Fest or, you know, and, and giving people a chance who wouldn't necessarily come here to come here and see you know, what the people are like and what we care about and what we're thinking. It's about, you know, creating 
um, you know, I'd love to do like a, uh, not yet, but when we, when we get a little bit further along, like, you know, a Kaduna marathon or a Kaduna like half marathon or a road race of some kind, you know, like there are these things that you can do. And then it's just about maintaining consistency, right? Like not just letting it drop when one, you know, administration ends and another begins, but having everybody buy into whatever that idea is enough that it can sort of withstand any kind of changes in, in the sort of political weather. So to me, you know, we're happy to be a part of that. And I want that because I want my employees to be excited about living here as well um, and not for them to, you know, jump off somewhere. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much to the panelists. So, so we'll start there. There's the first, arm I, the first hand I saw right there. Please introduce yourself and ask your question. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Suleiman. I think I have a bit of double barrel question. Um, according to recent statistics by PwC, that Nigeria has about 84% of uh, Nigeria's economy is uh, MSMEs, micro, small, and medium enterprises. And uh, globally, MSMEs account for, um, contribute, you know, to a greater extent to the economy of virtually every country in the world. It is, it is the backbone of every economy in the world. Now, my question goes this way. Uh, to Hafiz Bayero, how does, what is Kaduna State Government doing, or what has Kaduna State Government done to ensure the growth of MSMEs in terms of uh, growth, in terms of access to finance, you know, and so forth? To Tomato Joss, to Mira, have you any deliberate policy to incorporate MSMEs into what you are doing and uh, how they can be positioned better? Uh, to Sanusi. <laughs> it was supposed this to be is, one question. Or? Yes, okay. that's why I said it's a little bit double barrel. So this Triple. is 21st century. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> So this is uh, 21st century. We are talking about digita uh, digitization and technology. In what ways do you think this process will help SMEs, MSMEs to be positioned better in the 21st century such that they meet up with the 21st century demand? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, because of our time, um, I, I will lock two of your barrels and only take one. Um, <laughs> So Hafiz, if you would answer the question about is there any deliberate policy or strategy to okay, address just, just quickly because um, I can see the time is running out. We have many programs that this state has um, uh, brought up to support MSMEs, like the Cut Step program. And just uh, most people talk about access to finance to MSMEs, but also we need to also look at the side of the MSMEs. How ready are they? Most MSMEs, and I'm not trying to say they are not, but but money will not come and meet you in your house. You know, how willing are they to learn about regulations? How willing are they to go to NAVDAC? How willing are they to go to SOM and, and, and see that, okay, this is what is required for me to get to this level, even before the time of uh, accessing finance. And it's just not about accessing finance, um, you know, when people talk about SMEs. Even these linkages that we are creating, there is somebody who supplies maybe uh, fertilizer to her that is indigenous in Kaduna. Because of the presence of this sort of business, they will supply that fertilizer. There are people that maybe supply computer products to him. They are also MSMEs, but because of this large, so it's also being able to look at all these large scale investors and create linkages uh, for them locally because there is no single person that can come to a state or to a city and have everything they require. I just spoke about Olam getting all its uh, feed raw materials from villages in Giwa and Liri. So they are also MSMEs. They are not formalized, but they are MSMEs. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman with the glasses. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joseph. Uh, my name is Ismail Awel, and I'm from Kanu. And, and to quickly address, a uh, uh, let me say a misinformation said by you, 
I think uh, before 2015, there was no time in history where Kaduna is better than Kano. Even when Kaduna was the head of Northern Protectorate. Uh, after 20, maybe in 2015, election come, Kaduna got Maren Nasu Rufai, and very unlucky for us, we had what we have. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to, to direct my question to, also to uh, Mala Hafiz, uh, Mala Hafiz Bayru. Uh, I've been religiously following the activities of Kaduna State Government, and I think I even know better what Kaduna State is doing than Kano because of the wonderful job you are doing. I would like to say thank you to Hafiz and all the young people there. My question is this, what if, what if today or tomorrow, maybe after 2023, Manu Nasir is not going to be the governor of Kaduna State, what measures do you put in place as a government to make sure yes. for sustainability? Thank you very much. Okay, before, before you answer the question, so the question is, what's the plan for sustainability? I'll take the lady behind the screen. There's a lady behind the screen. Orange. Yeah. Orange. Yes. No, she's no, no, there. yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fatia Wubakar. I had a question about um, rebuilding the cosmopolitan cities, just like the title had. There are a lot of young people who are interested and have ideas and would like to join young people like you in government to help you rebuild those cities. So what are ways in which young people can collaborate with you with designs, with architecture, with art? How do we, how do we as people who are non-indigenous as well as indigenous of Kaduna merge with you to rebuild those cosmopolitan cities? Thank you. All right. Um, I think I've taken two from this side. Um, I will take one more question from the gentleman over there. Yes. I am finally lucky after many trials. <laughs> uh, my name is Sani Musa Ibrahim. And uh, OK, uh, you know, anytime anyone is having conversations around building cosmopolitan cities, of course, what comes first is the issue of funding. So I want to know, since this is a live performance, I want to know from the state government, uh, this question is particularly to, to Hafiz Bayero, on the unique things that Kaduna did on how, to, how they funded this project and how they were able to build this beauty within di just seven years. Because so many state governments make it as an excuse that there is limited resources. So how did Kaduna do this in just these years? All right, so I'll combine all the questions into one. For all the other questions, please just write them down and send them. I don't know what you'll do with them, but our time is up. Um, so Hafiz, there are two questions directed at you. How do we sustain what is going on in Kaduna, and how can it be scaled up to other parts of northern Nigeria? I think that's the essence of the two questions that have been asked, and how can we include more young people in the process? You have two minutes exactly to answer the question. Wow, okay, so um, um, how do we sustain this? Um, first of all, I must say, I'm not the governor, but I'll tell the governor that you asked this. But I've heard him answer this question a few times. Uh, and with giving a lot of young people opportunity, again, the word opportunity in Kaduna, what they've made out of it is their own. We have. I can see Khalil there, I can see Hannah. I was also young when I joined this government. I'm an old person now. <laughs> Somebody asked me, why, said, I didn't see your name on the APC Youth. There's some APC Youth program going on. I'm 35, 35 year olds are no longer young people. Please leave it for 28 and below. But at the same time, we have so many. You saw Tama, who was fantastic, the pan panel before this. There are so many, I don't want to, Dolapo is here, Yemi is here. Um, Aaron is here, just be, Aaron works with me, is the chief sufferer of KCTA. Um, there are so many brilliant people. Honestly, it's about giving them the opportunity. And in this government, this government has shown that we are willing to trust and give young people opportunity and, and guide them, not just throw them in there, to not just mentor them, but to make them mentors in such a short time so they can mentor those younger than them. And we, are, we keep producing young people. What's the second question? How do we scale it up? Like I said, in Kaduna, almost everybody today that is heading an MDA, well, take out the ministries, let's say departments and agencies, they are mostly below 40. 
And I'm very sure in the next two years, they'll be below 35. It's a natural thing. We've, the governor has already put that in uh, motion, and I don't see anything stopping it. All of you here, if you're interested in public service, try and get into government. There are many opportunities, and very soon you will be the one sitting here, not me. Thank you.